I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Maserati Rick in Detroit Convertible bird in Miami Graduated summa cum laude Strip club made a tsunami Carlton Hines with the ball game Grateful Edmonds with the snowflakes Craig Pettis in the M-Town Sal Magluta with the boat game Falcone with the cocaine Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game Like Monster Cody in South Central Larry Davis from Close Range That's what you're doing Vanessa What's that Vanessa? Take it easy, man. You have a good one. Thanks a lot. He's not a presidential advisor yet, but his rap has gained him entry to the Republican elite. More on this new insider from Chief Washington correspondent Bob Schieffer. If you're cool, you know the center of attention at Washington's National Airport last night was that hot new rapper Easy E, whose rap is a little well. It's a little on the on the dirty two life crew side, but not quite to that extent. Not that he's not like um, abusing women, but right. You know, he, yeah. it had a couple swear words in it. More than a couple, it turns out. And his biggest hit is so controversial, the FBI protested. We couldn't broadcast it on a day. The name of the uh, record? The record. Yeah. The police. Which is why you might not have guessed that Easy E, Eric Wright is his real name, would be among this group of well off Republicans who paid $1,250 to become members of something called the Republican Inner Circle, who were waiting in line today to hear law and order man George Bush at a private members only reception. You would have been surprised because Easy es group is not exactly the voice of the establishment. What, what is your group now? NWA. And what does that stand for? Niggas with attitudes. So why was Easy e there? Mainly because he was invited. Like many Americans, he received a fundraising letter from Texas Senator Phil Graham inviting him to join the elite inner circle for a thousand bucks, of course. In a follow-up note, Senate Republican leader Bob Dole pointed out his fellow members would include Arnold Schwarzenegger and George Shultz. Before the Republicans realized it was all a computer foul-up, Easy e just sent in the money and was made an official member. Do you think that uh, Senator Phil Graham and uh, the other members of the Republican inner circle know who Eric is and what he does? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I think that that probably they would be shocked to find out who he really is. And, uh, but as for us, we're happy to be here. Whatever else all this means, Easy e says he thinks it's cool, and it does seem to underline one truth that applies to politicians of both parties these days. If you've got the money, they've got the time. Next tonight, federal intervention in the drug war in the nation's capital. As we reported, federal drug policy director William Bennett today announced a multi-million dollar plan to help Washington, D.C. fight drug-related crime. Administration officials consider this initiative as a test case in the national battle against drugs and crime. The plan involves several different federal agencies and represents the first full-scale assault coordinated by the nation's drug czar. We'll discuss today's announcement after this background report by Kwame Holman. For nearly 18 months, the drug-related death toll in and around Washington has risen steadily. In the city alone, 135 people were murdered since the start of the year. Local officials say 80% of the killings arose from disputes in the city's drug trade. The violence has drawn increasing attention from members of Congress who make Washington their home. At a recent hearing, U.S. senators voiced their impatience with the city's efforts to stem the drug murders. You can't have people killed and blood running in the streets of the city like it was some third world capital run by a despot. Similarly, the Bush administration has focused on the city's drug problem. Last month, drug policy director William Bennett considered a plan to take federal control of the city police department. Today, Bennett announced instead a multi-agency federal task force to buttress the city's efforts against drug-related violence. Here, where the problem is so glaring, so out of control, serious questions of local politics and governance can no longer be avoided or excused. They must be answered. We've determined that, consistent with the federal government's special relationship to the district, the need and the means exist for significant federal emergency assistance to the people of this city and this region. Today, we are announcing a plan for such assistance. 
Among Bennett's proposals is immediate relief for the city's vastly overcrowded prison system. In the last 18 months, D.C. police arrested 30,000 people on drug charges, the highest per capita arrest rate in the nation. The Bennett plan on prisons calls for transfer of 250 inmates currently in the Washington jail to federal prisons. The resulting new jail space would be used to house new drug suspects arrested in the city. The plan also commits the Federal Bureau of Prisons to build a new 500-bed prison for the city and a 700-bed federal facility to house prisoners from the Washington-Baltimore region. Housing Secretary Jack Kemp's department is one of the seven federal agencies cooperating in the Bush-Bennett anti-drug plan. I'm asking today uh, D.C. Police Chief and the Public Housing Authority of D.C., along with public housing authorities around the country, to engage in those type of uh, operations that can clear out and secure public housing projects from drug users and abusers and dealers. The housing secretary's part of the anti-drug plan includes elimination of administrative rules to allow speedier evictions of public housing residents suspected of illegal drug activity, posting guards and erecting fences around public housing projects, requiring photo ID cards for entrance into public housing areas. Some of Kemp's initiatives already are in place in public housing developments. In Chicago, access to public housing already requires an ID card. Chicago officials say crime in those neighborhoods has fallen 30%. And the suburban Washington city of Alexandria recently received Kemp's permission to eliminate administrative eviction procedures. Housing officials in Alexandria and throughout Virginia now may evict public housing tenants first and defend the eviction in court later. The city of Alexandria's request to speed up the public housing eviction process grew out of this incident last month. A suspected drug dealer shot one Alexandria police officer to death and wounded another in this public housing development. Reportedly, he was trying to collect money from a young cocaine dealer who lived there. The last major component of the federal plan to help Washington, D.C. involves commitment of new federal law enforcement personnel. The Federal Bureau of Investigation will temporarily add 25 agents to its investigative resources of major drug distribution networks and drug-related violent crime in the Washington metropolitan area to provide enhanced technical and forensic advice. That technical advice includes access to the FBI's sophisticated evidence examination laboratory help from 57 new investigators, including lawyers and military intelligence experts from the Department of Defense. A review of whether to employ the National Guard in Washington's war on drugs. Yo, yo, we back. It's your boy, Pop a lot. Mob ties. We on our way to the district with it. Chocolate City, D.C. All my real people from D.C., y'all get in the comment box. Y'all know how we run it right now. Now, this story is going to have ties to like Northwest Washington, D.C., but we're talking about a legend. So the whole D.C. going to know about this story. Now, the person that we're going to be covering today is none other than the infamous Michael Anthony Salters or Michael Frey Salters or Frey, however you want to call him. He's definitely going to be a big dog in the city and definitely at that time we're talking the 1980s, the 1990s, early 1990s, actually. And Michael Frey Salters was called the ambassador of D.C. So it's like you really can't talk about him without talking about the city. And if we're talking about the city at that time, Washington, D.C. was going up. It would be in and around that same time that Washington, D.C. would be named the murder capital or leading up to it. The drugs was ravishing the city real heavy. It was definitely a lot of murders going on. And through all that death and destruction, there was a guy like Michael Frey that the city and numerous people would name would be like a staple or somebody that held the city together. So since we're on the subject of that and we're talking about D.C., it's we're going to talk a little bit about the rules because I remember personally, I want to say in around 2000 and a lot of this, this story has heavy ties and ramifications to Alpo. You're going to hear names like Wayne Perry. Um... And you're also going to hear a guy by the name of Michael Jackson, who's going to be a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal person in this story. But back to D.C., if my memory suits me right, this is going to be around 2000. This is a personal story. 
I remember being in Brooklyn on a block, Lenox Avenue between New York and Nostrand, and with a particular, almost uh, kind of a role model, R.I.P. to Bam Bam, shout out to him. He's going to be one of the first people that let me know how the shit played in D.C. Because he was actually in the streets at the time. And he had just came back from a stint in D.C. And one thing I remember about this particular conversation is because we had many. This is my homeboy, Big Cousin. So it's like I was always over there and he was always trying to school us to game. But on this particular day, he happened to be talking about how he was hustling in D.C. So as he explaining these stories, it culminates in one where he would go on to tell us about a skirmish that he got into with some guys from D.C. And he would say at that time, don't ever let a D.C. nigga know that you from New York because it's on you. And at the time, I had no clue. I'm oblivious to anything. But as time would play out, a lot of it had to do with Michael Frey Salter's and Alpo and just how New York dudes are perceived when they going out of town, especially in the crack era, I want to say. The drug game period, but definitely the crack era. Now, with that being said, we all know DC ain't nothing to play with. So Michael Frey Salters was born in 1953, late December, Northwest Washington, DC, on a street called Weber. And it's going to say that he came from a stable home, but he always had a pension to try to get some money. And it was said that he ran with two gangs in the city at that time, the Marlboro 500s and the Rock Boys. And it was through those gang affiliations that they said that he would begin performing a series of armed robberies. He dabbled in heroin a little bit, but he also said to have a love for boxing and he would train and that's how he would channel his aggression and he would become very competitive and they said that he would never turn down a fight. He was willing to scrap down with anybody. Now, it was said that Frey's teenage crimes would eventually catch up to him in 1974 at the age of 19. And he was placed in, which is now closed, the youth center at Lorton Reformatory in Laurel Hill, Virginia. So it was said that in jail, he would even sharpen up his hand skills. And in a Don Diva interview, a guy by the name of Fats would explain a situation how he arrived at the detention center at that same year of 1974. Somebody had broken into his locker and Frey went on to identify the person that broke into his locker, got his stuff back, and he would end up making the same dude apologize to Fats for breaking into his locker. Now it's stories about a chair that he would leave in the rec room. He would dare anybody to sit on that chair and they said that he would terrorize that youth sector so bad that he was moved to a bullpen area almost for more mature convicts that were serving time for robberies, rapes, murder. And they would say he would go on to witness all kind of shit during that time. And during his time of incarceration is really the staple of how he gained his reputation or he would establish certain relationships with certain peoples in different territories throughout dc that would give him a certain pass or a certain amount of leverage to do business in these particular areas so when he got out in 1978 it was said that he got an ounce of marijuana from a friend and within months he turned that ounce of marijuana into pounds it was with these proceeds from the marijuana business that they said that he would go on to shift into the heroin business where he would trademark a brand of heroin titled Black Snake. And it was at that time that word began spreading about him and this product, and that would boost his reputation even furthermore. Now it would be during the course of this where Michael Frey Salters would be charged with a murder of a guy by the name of Avon Little. Now it was rumored that Avon Little had snatched a purse from a woman, not knowing that it was Frey's girlfriend. Not much longer, Little's body was found in an alley off of Wiltsburger Street, a few blocks away from Howard University. Now, Salters would eventually be charged with that murder, but he managed to beat the case due to a witness not appearing in court. However, fully knowing that he was on the radar of the federal government, he would begin to lay low 
and he eventually would be arrested in New Jersey and extradited back to Washington, D.C. Now, he wasn't served long on that probation violation before he would touch down back in the streets in the early 80s. Now, by all accounts, that's going to be when he had got into the PCP business using a plug that he had out in California. And it was rumored that his angel dust would flow through the city and he racked up a vast amount of money. It was said that he even secured a part of Hanover Place Northwest, which had been an infamous spot to run drugs through since the early 1970s. Now, law enforcement would go on to say that Frey's name would be implicated in drug deals of more than 200 pounds, but he had proved too well insulated from direct involvement to be charged with any crimes. Now, agents put him under immense surveillance and they interviewed drug dealers who they said had worked for him on top of his name coming up in numerous wiretaps. Federal drug officials said that they've been told by several drug dealers that some dealers had ceded to Salters the power to assign drug territories for PCP, heroin, cocaine, and other drugs. So he pretty much was almost like a traffic guard. Some people would not see Frey's real power until the trial of notorious cocaine kingpin Rayful Edmonds III now at a pretrial hearing in the cocaine distribution case, Salters was identified as a person who in August of 1988 imposed a ceasefire and a bloody warfare between Edmonds and a breakaway faction of his crew that moved to the Trinidad section of Northwest Washington. And that feud was responsible, I wanna say they said upwards of 30 murders. So he was able to end that. And it would be the course of all of this time where he would have a run in with Alpo because Alpo would be in the city at the same time. And it was said that Frey not being keen to out of towners, definitely New Yorkers coming down and almost just an ambassador for the city. You know, the city need to eat off this. This is ours, not theirs type situation. And according to the streets, it would be that that would cause him to take off Alpo for some work or identified amount of work and pretty much it was said to have Alpo in fear. And this was said by Wayne Perry. And that's pretty much almost how Wayne Perry came into play because Alpo would get a lot of heat from other people, mainly by a guy by the name of Jawbreaker, but also Michael Frey Salters. He also was closely allied with another drug kingpin, a guy by the name of Eddie Mathis, who was involved in his own bloody battle with a rival gang where multiple people were killed. So DC was very, very, very violent at this time. Now we're going to fast forward to July of 1991. And that's where Frey would meet his demise, where he would be shot more than six times while traveling in a vehicle. Now, at the time of his death, the Washington Post would report that an uh, unknown individual cut off a series of cars that were traveling with Salters just to open up fire on him. And it would be a lot of almost speculation or almost the whole city was dumbfounded because of the stature that he had. He was definitely well loved in the city and it was probably hard for them to determine any kind of enemy that would want to do this to Frey. But as time went on, Alpo would be named in the 27 count indictment, along with Wayne Perry and a series of other individuals. One of these individuals would be a guy by the name of Michael Jackson, who I seen Wayne Perry referred to as a guy that would hang out at a shop that they would be near. But looking at the case, he was named in nine murders. So it's almost like Michael Jackson was pretty much working under Alpo. And this is according to the Washington Post and working along with Wayne Perry. Some sources try to make it seem like he was aligned or he was working with Frey. It was said that he owed Frey in some sources and and this is rumored it was said that he owed Frey he was scared of Frey he took a contract from Alpo to kill Frey now Wayne Perry would go into detail a little bit more talking about after the murder of Frey at his funeral it was rumored that Wayne had did it it was a series of guys talking and his baby mom had heard it now Michael Jackson 
after being arrested, because Wayne Perry said all of a lot of this information came out after he was in jail, Michael Jackson would come to Wayne Perry saying that his baby mom was suggesting that he killed Frey. And in turn, it was said that Wayne Perry had murdered her. So like, it's a lot of like vicious rumors and allegations that go on. And it just crossed so many paths. Michael Frey soldiers because it's Rayful Edmonds, Eddie Mathis, Wayne Perry, Alpo, Cornell Jones, even when you talk about Hanover Place. So he was definitely tied to the city and he was definitely somebody that you could name or label the ambassador. Anybody from DC that was around at the time, I definitely want y'all to speak on that no fly zone almost, I want to say for New York, like almost from 91 going past because shit was wicked um and anybody else y'all make sure y'all follow me on instagram on twitter pop underscore a underscore lot y'all make sure y'all hit the bell right under this video so y'all know when this real trail spill shit is dropping y'all know we're gonna be back with some more y'all get at me on direct message email text call me CC me, stop me in the street, however y'all want to handle it. I'm here for all of it. Y'all already know what it is. It's your boy Papala. It's the mob. Mob, 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 ties.